I saw the next performer, I saw the next role model actually perform as well. My first encounter with her. Uh, I saw her perform at a, a show. Actually, so much stuff happens here. I saw her at a show next door, right here. If you ever saw the Janis Joplin musical here on Broadway, she was the Tony nominee playing Janis Joplin. I'd like to bring to you Mary Bridget Davies. Hi. How are you guys doing? Right? I've almost recovered from said stories before. No, literally, when Dory was talking about Giddy, I was like, oh my God, a pearl, my gay, oh my God, and we used to call her ball the Giddy, and I can't, and just crying, and it's good to cry. Like this, I just want to welcome everyone, because you either were interested in, or you're full of and done with putting up with fuckery. <laughs> Correct? It's one of my favorite words. And I was born fucked, um, and I'll tell you why. I was born with an autoimmune deficiency called psoriasis. And what it does is it manifests itself as a skin disease. So not only do you feel like shit, you look like shit. You're covered from head to toe in red scales. And you're, you're, you have absolutely no self-confidence. But I was a little kid with a dream. There's a video of me, and I'm three years old. And I got to tell you, it's one of those VHS, like, shaky tapes in the basement of, like, a fire station in Fairview Park, Ohio. And it's my, and with our glorious Cleveland accents, like, come on, no, they're coming out now. Shh, Brian, be quiet, are you recording, you know? Hear my grandma in the back, which is the cool part, because, you know, I was young when I lost them. But, so all the ballerinas come out. And they're perfect little leotards and their their little underpants tucked under just so and their their tights are lined up in the back with their buns that are just slicked back for Jesus and just <laughs> you know, just mel just helmet heads. And I come out picking my wedge, <laughs> bun askew, just ready for and I'm like, mm, up here? I don't think so. That takes way too much energy. I'm like, okay. The music starts. People are looking at us. I'm like, what? Start picking my nose. <laughs> See my family. Wave. I'm like, what's up? Aren't you proud of me? All of them. They start moving, right? And my best friend, Brooke, literally, I was born August 30th. She was born September 1st. Our mothers recovered in the hospital together. We literally have been best friends since birth. And so she starts going. I'm like, okay, Brooke. And I start following her around. We're going, Susu. And of course, Susu for me was flat footed with my hands like this. And then I run into the back of her head because I'm looking at everyone looking at us because I'm like, this is amazing. And I'm like, crack. And she's like, and I'm like, <laughs> you see it. I'm like, I'm sorry. Three. So we don't even have that in our vocabulary yet that like you win and I'm the asshole, which is kind of what's been our dynamic for a time of memorial. So then I, I decide to punch in and I do a little down do and I put my arms up and I go down and I come up and I fall. <laughs> and everybody laughs and I'm like, wait, there's something to this. <laughs> so you mean to tell me I can come just like shuffling in, like half assing it the whole way and steal the show? It's good. So we finish, and I see my family, and people start clapping. Now, this is the first time I've ever heard people clap, like, more than just, like, happy birthday to you. Okay, blow out the candles, Bridget. This was, like, 50 people. And I was, like, everyone, we start leaving, and I stop, and I put my hands on my tutu, and then I folded my hands on my tutu. Like, yes. You're welcome. And I start walking away, and I turn and I wave. And then I just run off with the rest of the kids, and my, my grandma goes, uh-oh. And that's what it had always been. It's just been an uh-oh situation because I've always wanted to perform, and I've always wanted to make people happy. And Brooke was an Eeyore, and I fucking hate Eeyores, man. I fucking, because I'm an Eeyore on the inside. Don't get me wrong, but you'll never see me talking about, lost my tail again. I'm tiggering on that fucking tail. Okay, because I don't want to bum you out, man. I don't want to bum you out with my bullshit and my, oh, my life is terrible and I'm so insecure. No. So she would do that and I would make her laugh and, and that was our dynamic, but that became who, who my outer persona is. I'm actually a very anxiety-riddled and introverted person. If you don't know me, when I'm here, this thing is like a wall. And I'm like, you can't touch me, no, no, no. But I, I, see, I see you by the bathroom. I'm like, hi, how are you doing? I'm like, uh, what is it from Office Space? 
I was like, I have the red stapler. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm like, Milton. I'm like, there's two squirrels outside, and they're getting married. They moved my office to the bit. You haven't been on payroll for eight years. No, no, it's okay. Like, I deserve it or something. But so I've always tiggered out. And um, so moving on from the dance stuff, then you get into dance where it's like, hey, guess what? We're in competitive dance. You know what that means? Sew your mouth shut. And also... <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. And also, you're like going to be naked all the time. No, this is where the psoriasis kicks in, and I'm like, no. Clearly, I could do something at like, well, can we do tap? Is tap good? Can you wear clothes and tap? And they're like, you wear more clothes and tap. I'm like, tap it is. So then that's where the rhythm came in, and that's where that soul came in. My parents grew their baby boomers, and they grew up, I grew up listening to the best music that a kid that was listening to also Salt and Pepper and New Kids on the Block. And all that good stuff. Bell, 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 that girl is, mm, mm. Never trust a big button to smile. I'm like, yeah, you can. Watch, I'm going to have one when I'm older. You know. And my mom's like, who are you talking to? Because that was me in my bedroom. <laughs> we had a canopy bed, so I was like, this is my microphone now. Do you guys, anyone know? If you don't, it's okay. But so it's just this little thing that you would like, it was like hastily glued to the top. And you could pull it off and it was just like your microphone and I had two older sisters so I'm like that's your microphone that's your microphone I took your nail polish and put orange on the top so this one's mine like I had to like I already labeled like rhinestoned out and um that's who I wanted to be but my parents had this like we would listen to James Brown please 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 like every Thanksgiving after we'd eat we're all full and my aunt would do the thing and she'd throw the she'd throw the blanket off and I'm like this is this is entertaining like this is amazing you know how do I how do I do this so we're in dance, we're in these dance competitions, there was an open category where, you know, the baton twirlers could do that weird, awkward thing for like two minutes and everyone's like, oh, yeah, that's good, okay, thanks. How do we score that? I don't know how to score that. Like some kids came out and did like serious, serious dramatic monologues and you're like, I don't, you're 11, where does that come from? Like it's, <laughs> it's beautiful, I don't know. And then I came out and I sang, Twilight Time by the Platters in this dress that was like this big. It was like a Gone with the Wind. It was, a, it was an ordeal. It was like this teal taffeta thing. And it was to one of those, um, remember when karaoke was just like the, the VHS, or excuse me, the, the cassette tape track? And then you had like the other one at home where you could tape yourself on the other cassette set. I'm 38 years old. I'm not afraid to tell you how old I am. And, and, and uh, you'd be like, okay, I'm, I sound good on that, and we're going to do that. So come out in the cassette kit, and I'm like, heavenly shades of night are falling. It's twilight time. And my mom's like, do the dip. You can see her in the back of the room. And I'm like, I'm 12 now. Like, I understand basic motor function, mom. It's cool. Because we have a terrible, terrible, like, stage mom and daughter love-hate relationship. Like, I would literally be stomping around, like, changing my numbers, like, the night before this, for the thing. She's like, she's get, Brian, and she, but my, both my parents chain smoke. She's losing, she's gonna lose. She's gonna lose. She's changing everything? All the hard work we've, we've done. She was a full-time nurse. I, look, she lied to my dad about how expensive those costumes were, and that was a big deal, because, they were like, a hundred bucks for, like, a bathing suit with a hat and like a little bit of sequence was total BS and my dad would have said nope you're getting a job and I did then that goes to the next part so he found out so then I had to work a casual corner and folding and here's what was so great because I'm thinking I'm gonna get a sales job right commissions baby they're like um and the woman literally was like you're you're kind of a strange girl aren't you and I'm like yeah like at that point I was 15 I was like yeah and uh, she's like, well, we'll just have you do inventory in the back. So literally, I was the one that was steaming all of your like luxury gowns in the back, listening to Bush 16 Stone, breathe in, breathe out. It was like so angsty. And I was like, yeah. And I'm like, I got to get out of here. So I did. And I went to college. And then I had no parental, none, no parental advisory, anything. And I forgot to go to school. What happened to you? <laughs> I graduated high school with a 3.8, and I uh, ended my first uh, semester at Kent State with a 1.4. And my, they were like, there's freshman forgiveness, and my mother sent me to an all-girl Catholic college next. 
that was going to teach me. What it taught me was those girls were more crazy than the public school girls because they were already doing coke and getting tattoos. And we were like literally three months into our 18th birthdays. And I was like, you know, this isn't hitting it either. I was like, well, maybe I'll just go... Okay, I'll be good. I'll go to Bowling Green, Mom. I'll go to Bowling Green. It's kind of a party school, but it's kind of got a good performing arts program, and I swear I'll put my best foot forward. And all that was was that fear. Because I always was told growing up, oh, you're a real good singer, Bridget. Like, yeah, this is definitely what you should do. But it's like when you had to prove it. And then what if they said no? Like, yeah, you're all right. You know, that, then that, that was going to be Dash. So I was on crew. I was in the Model United Nations. I would debate people, and I was just this completely other different version of myself because I was afraid of the person that lives in here was finally going to be found out as a fraud. And they go, yeah, well, you're just like everybody else, so you know, forget about it, screw you. So I did that, and I kept my head down, and I went to school. And then it was about the third, third year, and I was like, you know what I'm going to do, Mom? And she's like, I hate when you start a sentence that way. <laughs> I said, I'm going to quit. There's an improv company downtown, and there's no girls in it, and I'm pretty funny, right? She's like, that's not the point. <laughs> She's like, what are you talking about? I said, I'm going to quit school. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. She's like, well, how are you going to support yourself? And I said, I'm going to get a job at UPS. <laughs> and I did from 3 a.m. to 9 a.m. I loaded package trucks. And you know what those assholes did to me? They put me on three trucks. Normally you have two. They put me on three, and it was a, it was a mall. It was like a, where there was a Cintas, uniforms, gateway computer, like the heaviest things you possibly could. And my, my thing, my cage was bottom tan. So it started up here like blue, red, green, tan. So it'd be like, these computers coming like down here and I'd have to like whip them over and do it. And I'm like, I will not, I will not let myself down. I will make this happen. So I auditioned for the comedy company and I made it in and I got to go to the uh, Chicago Improv Festival in 2001. And I got to meet Tina Fey because my company completely got hammered and didn't show up for our Improv Olympic spot at three in the morning. <laughs> so I'm like, estudiante. See, like if, I, if I'm really into something, I'm there, you know, bells are on and everything. And this kid from Boston that was sa- same kind of like work ethic as me, we're standing there, but he knew Horatio Sands and Tina Fey. He's like, well, what are we going to do? You want to just play? You want to play? And I'm like, you want Tina Fey and Horatio to want me to play with them? And they're like, yeah, it's three in the... And she goes, yeah, it's three in the morning. Everyone's drunk anyway. If you suck, no one will remember. <laughs> and we had the best time. And I was like, you know what? That's okay. And I stayed with that. And then I was just like, you know what? It's this singing thing that, that's, still, that's still on my chest. And I, I can't not live without that. So I went to uh, Fat Fish Blue, which is a club in Cleveland uh, where I'm from. And Robert Lockwood Jr., who was like, the son of Robert, you know, Lockwood, just, you just think about, like, no, 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 it's a big deal, it's a big deal, because he has, like, 300 of them, but the, this one lived in Cleveland, and he was the most famous, and he had the, the, the pedigree and the legacy, if you will, and um, I got up to sing at a blues club, and I was terrified, and I just sang the stuff that my mom and dad played, and he's like, you know, you're not bad, you might want to turn this into a career, and I was like, okay, how do you do that, and he goes, fuck if I know, <laughs> Because he was like 80 and playing in Cleveland for $50 on a Wednesday night. You know, it's rough. You know, it's really hard. And I was like, I don't care. I'm going to try that. So it became a cat and mouse game of which utility bill do I need to keep on? <laughs> I'm like, well, it's winter, so probably the gas so I don't freeze the pipes. But literally, I would be on the stove boiling water to go put in the tub to get ready for my show with a smile on my face and my like four-year-old MAC lipstick that I had money for once and go out there and just lie to everybody that I had my shit together because that's something that my great-grandfather said. He goes, no matter... And he killed a man and went to prison. (laughs) It was an accident. It was a bar fight. Whatever. It was... It's like 1918. Whatever. I wasn't around. Were you there? I don't know the real story. And uh, he said, he said, he goes, Bridget... He goes, even when you're down and if they ask you, you know, how you doing? Say, I'm great, never been better, how are you? And I said, okay, and I'll remember that, and I did. So while I'm boiling water to take a bath to come do a show, you know, I'm just coming in like everything's fine. And uh, that took a lot of years, and as something that Faye was saying, I I wound up doing that thing where you marry your bass player. (laughs) Because you're like, oh my God, it's like double money. And we live in the same house, and like it's gonna totally work out. You'll support me, right? 
Crickets. I get my first theater show, and it's Love Janice, this other show about Janice Joplin, and uh, he didn't show up. He didn't show up to closing. He didn't show He left after the opening night party, like, halfway through because he was tired. He didn't even have a fucking job. <laughs> I was tired. I just want to go to bed, you know? And, I, and he didn't have a driver's license, so, like, I would have to leave events early to take him home because I had to stand by my man, Tammy Wynette. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> It was a, how about he stands next to me because I'm pulling my shit together right now and he should be supporting me and if he fucking turns around and does the same, I'll do the same fuck thing for him. Fuck. <laughs> fuck thyself. He can fuck thyself and we're unfucking ourselves. Yeah, he just posted on Facebook and I'm like, you know what? Unfriend, what am I doing? I'm like, we've been divorced for like a billion years. And his wife, like, asks me, I'm like, really, girlfriend? Like, if you haven't figured that shit out yet, I, it's not my cross to bear anymore. But they were, like, all over face, like, we're moving, we're moving to Florida. <laughs> and I'm like, who the fuck? Okay, you know what? Unfriend, I'll do it. But what is that fear? Well, what if I miss out on some? Who fucking cares if you're missing out on people who don't? You have to surround yourself with people that care about you and that want to see you doing better than you're doing today and that enjoy your company and that push you to do better than you're already doing. And it doesn't mean that you compete with. That There's a difference to that. Your girlfriend that you're like, oh, let's go to the gym, okay. And then you're on the treadmill and you're like, oh, I'm, not, I'm not even tired. Because you're being competitive bitches, that's not your friend. <laughs> She's your, she's your acquaintance, and you should have acquaintances. There should be a hierarchy like the little, uh, you know, the pyramid. You just have a few good ones on top, and the rest let it fall down, and the farther out they go, that's good, and it's good to see you when I see you, and if I don't, I wish you well. Tell your mother I said hello. That's all you need. You just need a couple good people in your corner because they'll be the ones that'll let you know when you're fucking up, and you'll hate them for it because they're right. And I had that happen to me. So when I'm doing this theater thing and I kept doing the same show for the same amount of money for five years, maybe more, I'm the one that became the name pull and the draw and everything else. And I'd be like, so like, do I get a pay rate? Well, no, you know, times are hard. I didn't have an agent. I was trying to do it all by myself. And I just had no self-worth. I said, I'm like a little puppet that you press a button and I go out there and I do that. And that's lying to myself as an artist. And that's not kicking it anymore like, I can't pay the bills this way and how what am I gonna do what am I gonna this is the only thing I know how to do which is bullshit and if you find yourself in that loop we're like well this is the only character I know how to do or this is the only music I know how to play or this is the only way I know how to express myself it's just the only one you've decided was good enough that you could keep things going and keep up appearances for now you know, the fuckery is normalcy. Fuckery is that thing where you're like, mm, but I can't leave and we've been together so long. And I mean, like, we have a house and who's going to get the cat? Who's going to? I mean, this is a big fucking deal. It's like, it's just such a hassle. We'll just stay together miserably. I would rather be totally by myself and with my shit together and then someone orbits into my astral plane who's also on their own shit together planet and then we like lock and then, then the rings happen and it's a beautiful thing, Saturn shit. I don't want to have all of your Hubble telescope trash keep coming into my fucking atmosphere for me to feel like I have to clean it up. That's fucking yourself. That's fucking yourself. And so when I got to go to Broadway and I got to finally do the show, I was standing there, right? It's opening night. And I was like, everything's going to open up. And they was like, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage. And I had one of the most crippling anxiety attacks I've ever had in my life. Now, I don't know. You guys don't know me. But when I get a panic attack, I, I, become, I, I get claw hands and I can't move. And I can't make sounds. So like literally, like they started in like high school and I'd be in bed thinking I'm screaming for my mom, like, mom, help me. And literally I'm in, in bed like, mom. <laughs> so literally it's like, it's opening night. And, and it's like, and they start, it started clawing. And I was like, fuck you, you know what? You asked for this. And I snapped myself out of it. And then we did the show, and it was off to the races for then. And then there was an up. There was another up, right? You work hard, you get something good, and you get an up. 
But then we got a new producer and he shuttered the show. He's like, we can easily move it off Broadway and save a lot of money and pay him half as much. And it's going to, you know, it'll be good for us in the upstairs office. You fuck the people that do it every day. So the day before our first preview, they come in and they, they take the show away. They cancel the entire run. And I had a nervous breakdown, a real one. Not like, oh, I was really upset and I stomped around. I went back to my apartment and I drank like a handle of Bacardi and I took my copper pot. I'm like, who the fuck do that? And I was like hitting the wall. My boyfriend's like, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know how to handle it. And he called my mother. <laughs> I'm like, you called me. You know what she said? Well, you know, maybe she should go to Bellevue. She should learn a lesson. I said, I did learn a lesson, never, never to do anything without five billion contracts and five people in your corner, but there I was two years ago. This was two weeks before they announced the Tony nominations, and I'm sitting there with like a janky wrist, because I don't know, I threw something, and I was feeling sorry for myself, and I spent the night in the hospital, and I was like, that's it, we're going home. We're going home. Fuck these people, they don't appreciate me, but I didn't appreciate me, because I shouldn't have reacted that way. That was letting them get the best of me. Don't ever let people get the best of you because you're all you have, okay? So I'm here to show you that you can do better and you can come back from it. And then I was like, what? Lucy Liu just said my name on TV? I'm a Tony nominated actress? Ding, Tigger came back. <laughs> and Eeyore went to the fucking closet and that's where Eeyore belongs. So there's a show called Title of Show and they have a song called Die Vampire Die. And anytime you're thinking about that shit, they said there's a few different types of vampires, but the first ones are like gnats and they call them the pygmy vampires and they're your own little thoughts that fly around your head that said, your teeth need whitening. You went to state school, you sound weird, you know? Like, <laughs> you know, or like Sondheim and Sedaris did it before you and better than you, you know? And it's just, just the way that you, you talk yourself out of success because because who are you right who are you to, to get what you want out of life who aren't you to get what you want out of life you know and then the other one is the, the smell them up pine fresh air air freshener people like your mom or your aunt that think that what you're doing is too too risque or what you're doing is too lewd and you can't sing about you know vaginas or blowjobs or this that <laughs> And then they said, and when you're done, your work's just going to be toothless, gutless, and crotchless, but you're going to have two tight paragraphs about kittens that your grandma would be so proud of. And you don't want that. You just say, look, this is my traditional, that's what it was. That, that was my whole thing about this legacy. It's tradition. Just because it was traditional for our parents to go to school for four years, just because it was traditional for when you got out of school, if you were allowed to go to school as a girl, that you're supposed to get married and have children right away, that those traditions don't exist, especially not in this city, thank you, but just more and more as time goes by and you make your own traditions. And you know what? If your family's a piece of shit, have Thanksgiving with people here in the city that make you happy. You know what I mean? And spend time around people that want to spend time around you. And that's really fucking scary and that's really hard because these people raised you or you feel like you owe them something because you stood next to each other in blood. But... You know, once you're an adult, you get to choose your, your family, and that's all part of unfuckery. You know, undo that fabric. You know what? Take all that base stitching out, rip it, and make yourself your own fucking beautiful dream coat. Okay? So, I don't know. Do I say yeah. anything else? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry, I can't keep this up. Um, so, so, how do you give? How, how did you give yourself the permission to fuck everybody else and say, you know, I'm gonna do what I want to do? You know, how do you give yourself the permission to say, fuck, fuck it, I'm not gonna go to Thanksgiving. I'm gonna spend it here, right? How do you give yourself that permission? Because you you see, you are the only person that knows you better than anyone knows you, and you can lie to anybody, and you lie to we all lie to ourselves all the time. But when you sit there and go, okay, go. One, two, three, what's the thing that makes you happiest the most? And that's what you say. Mm -hmm. It's just that fear, and it's so funny with this net. I can't with you guys because <laughs> Steve Harvey had this thing. It was one of those like, oh, Facebook, everyone's passing this video around. And he said, you know, you might see all these people whizzing past you with their parachutes, getting that job, getting that life, getting that wife, getting that money, and this, that, the other thing. And you're standing on the edge of the cliff. Well, look, you're going to have to jump. 
He goes, the parachute will never open if you're standing on the cliff. He goes, you're going to have to jump, but you're going to fall down that hill. You're going to get scraped and scuffed and everything, but you keep trying to fly off that cliff, and eventually, once you trust yourself, it'll open up, and it's that. It's that, you know, the people that really want to be around you are going to be around you no matter what. You can't get rid of them. They're loyal, and it's a beautiful thing, and if you have one, you have one more than a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. So there you go. Mary Bridget Davies. I'm just sitting there going, we are so lucky to have people actually share these stories, like these stories today.